finally proved otherwise, and she still protests that she's not quite sure it was this. Well, who was the man who appeared in Kutu in January 2011? The man who claimed to be Kulekami Kumaru, the mythic Maskandi who would not sit at his own resurrection. Folk artist or con artist? Record maker or heartbreaker? Cultural icon or common criminal? To repeat my opening questions in another register, what does the story tell us about identity and subjectivity, about its fabrication, performance, and recognition here and elsewhere? The return of Kulekani Kumano recalls another, the return of Marta and Gare, subject of a well-known French movie, a couple of musicals, at least one historical novel, and an influential, an influential American scholarly work. The drama began in a 16th century village in southwest France, with the arrival of a man claiming to be Gare, who had abruptly left his wife, child, and family eight years before. Displaying considerable local knowledge, and an appearance not unlike that of the absconder, this in a world without photography, ideals, or figure printing, the returnee assumed the latter's family role for three years before his identity was contested, whereupon he was charged with imposture and finally hanged. In her brilliant analysis of the case, historian Natalie Zeman Davis argues that the fake Martin Gare sustained his credibility with the help of intimate others, those invested in the return of a character, a husband, a lover, a nephew, a brother, whom the fake played more effectively than had the original. The drama underlines for us just how collaborative and culturally nuanced is the production of plausible personhood everywhere, a point that turns out to be critically relevant to our South African story as well. But what, to go back to Kulikane Kumalo, was the outcome of his return, his resurrection? The brief answer is that the police decided that he too was an imposter. Um, and there you see the picture above of the original and below the man who returned. That he too was an imposter, once there was Cecil John Kabashi, a man with a questionable past that included arrests for theft, rape, and perjury. A man who, like Kulekane, is also a teller of stories, albeit of a different sort. A man who, according to his brother, Pelelani, has reinvented himself many times before, often by means of assuming false identities. At the request of the mother's people and the Selecos, the cops arraigned and fingerprinted this um, returnee soon after his public appearance whereupon his true identity was discovered, so the police said. Or rather, five pre previous identities were discovered, among which the police chose the one that looked the most plausible. South Africa may be one of the most biometrically oriented states in the world, i.e. oriented towards things like fingerprinting, one of the most digitally advanced and precocious, as the historian Keith Breckenridge has observed. But its efficacy is only as good as the bureau bureaucratic record keeping on which it depends, and as good as the technology itself. Digital fingerprinting, which remains unreliable, has also opened up new means of dissembling, impersonation, and duplication. And here we confront a strange late modern counterpoint between the fixing and unfixing of identity, between, on the one hand, the effort of states to profile panoptically all their subjects, and on the other, structural forces that blur the indices of personhood in new ways. In the face of all this, the man now called Kabashi continues to deny all charges before the court. He refuses even to answer to any name other than Kuleni or, or Kulekani. I've seen him in court, he is quite remarkable, but not responding either. Subjected to psychiatric testing, he was declared fit to stand trial. This notwithstanding his claim that he was being attacked by rich familiars and other occult forces in prison. Meanwhile, some of those closest to Kulekani, two of his wives and his paternal family, continue to insist that the returnee is him, 
despite the intervention of the law. Local musicians who are keeping a close watch on this case are divided. One of them, Siazi Zulu, told us that few must come to think that the return is Kulekani. Another, Rakindia Kadebe, has composed a satirical song about the whole fiasco, which is also singing, selling Waji. Uyimbudani Kabashi, he sings. You are a joke, Kabashi. But others are less sure, including a well known um, musicologist, ethnomusicologist, who is the world expert on the genre, a woman of Irish uh, origin who teaches at the University of KwaZulu Natal. She's very unsure as to whether, and she's been called to the fore now to produce something called Forensic Musicology Developing Practice. At the time of writing, the case is still making its way through the judicial system. At first, nobody seemed to know exactly what to do with it. The magistrate, who initially heard it in rural Mukutu in February 2012, handed the dockers on to the Director of Public Prosecutions for Guidance. By May that year, when the case was moved to a higher court, Rabashi's lawyer, one Johan Gwitter, said that he was still not sure what charges were actually being made against his client, although the, the, the media kept asserting that it was flawed. The lawyer also seemed unsure what line of defense to take, since until the matter was resolved legally, it was not really clear whether his client was Kabashi or Kulekani. Or, uh, um, and as we were to find out later, Gwerti himself remains unsure. As in, and, and in any event, if the state tried the accused of Kabashi, it could be said to have prejudiced the outcome of the case, surely a grounds for distrial. It was equally unclear whether if indeed Kabashi was an imposter, he could be found guilty of fraud under South African law, of which we were known. The Kumalos, firm in their conviction that the returnee is Kulekai, have sold some of their cattle to pay his legal fees. This, in addition to a cow slaughtered earlier in the presence of the ancestors to welcome them back into the family. In the meantime, however, the case has moved again now to Peter Maritzburg, the provincial capital, where the indictment for fraud has been bundled with those earlier charges of rape, theft, and perjury. For the present, the accused himself languishes in prison on the KwaZulu-Natal south coast, where he's been photographed with his guitar. We'll come back to some of these. Where he's been photographed with his guitar, where he now sings Maskanda and has composed 15 new songs, and where his warders, his guardians, both black and white, speak of him as a strangely compelling charismatic with an extraordinary knowledge of the life and times of Kulekani, echoes here again of Martin Gere. He has grown dreadlocks and, according to one correctional officer, looks more and more like Maskandi himself. As they put it to me, he has grown into himself. The racially diverse senior prison staff told us that none of them are willing to wager that their prisoner is not who he claims to be. Note that he, the prisoner, has also called for DNA testing and the exhumation of the buried body, thus to prove his authenticity. For reasons unstated, the police have refused to do this. For their part, the Vesuvius claim to have received death threats, that's the mother's people, death threats from the Kumalos, insisting that they cease their denials. And hearing after hearing, attended by ever larger crowds, ends in deferral. The long arm of the law has given way to the long durée. On one thing, however, most people appear to agree. In contemporary South Africa, there was, is little alternative than to appeal to the courts and to forensics for a resolution to the incommensurate claims over identity being made in this case. Even though, for all its promise to do so, the law is not likely to bring closure. Most lawyers to whom we have spoken about the case agree that the issue of personhood at stake here is far too complex for the criminal justice system to handle. If anything, it will only open up new lines of division. For me, I stress the significance of the story here does not depend on its outcome, the assessment of guilt or innocence, authenticity or duplicity. Its significance lies rather in what it tells us about the quest, in a time of shifting norms and indices of truth, 
for ways of establishing personhood in a post-colonial South Africa, and perhaps elsewhere as well. In writing about the case of Marta and Gere, perhaps the archetype of a counterfeit return, Natalie Zeman Davis notes that in 16th century France, imposture was not an isolated form of behavior, I quote her, not a disconnected monstrosity, but one extreme on a spectrum of self-fashioning for purposes of play, of advantage, or of attractive benevolence. What then might the spectrum of self-fashioning be that frames this drama of Kulikami's return and this incredible public passion that it ignited? How does the strange saga speak of the aspirations, the possibilities, and the impossibilities of producing a sustainable identity in South Africa today? As it turns out, post-apartheid South Africa is curiously hospitable to impersonators of all kinds. Its media are rife with stories of bogus lawyers, fake cops, bogus businessmen, even bogus soccer referees. Some of their fakery is downright dangerous, like that of the faux emergency personnel with degrees from a faux training college employed by the health authority of the Limpopo province. Or that of phony state as phony state physician, one of whom practiced with deadly effect in the Eastern Cape and served as a highly paid standby medic during the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, FIFA paid him a healthy salary. A qualification verification company, itself a new kind of institution thriving in this climate, warns that convincingly realistic graduation certificates are now easily purchased. Like many other fake documents, this of course again is not unique to South Africa. It is an industry honed to perfection, as the anthropologist Charles Pio shows, in places where official immigration papers are the magical key to mobility to the north or the west, and much across the south. Speaking of mobility, there was even a DJ in Johannesburg who told his radio audiences that he was calling live from the US, giving fulsome reports plagiarized from American magazines of his encounters with Jay-Z, Kanye West, Beyonce, and others. In fact, his broadcasts came from the basement parking lot below his studio prompting an amused colleague to say, and I quote him in a national newspaper, we South Africans are especially...